podcast. We just want to have this be a forum for indicating you want to talk, and uh, we'll go from there. <clears throat> so I do see a familiar name, Holly Johnson. Uh, and so I'll start with Holly if you want to uh, talk, and then we'll go and we'll move on down the list. So okay. Go ahead, Thank Holly. You. Thank you. I really just want to make this as a personal statement. I'm not speaking on behalf of CPAC or PTO, just um, my personal opinions. Uh, my first question is next week, are you voting to accept the three models or are you voting which model we're going to go with? Um, and then I have a, a little bit of a statement I'd like to read. Um, so I have some concerns about the plans for the fall and I just wanna take a minute to speak about those. I did attend six of the eight meetings held that went over all the plans. I feel like I learned something new or understood something better with every meeting I attended. So I really appreciate all of those meetings. Um, whether you decide to go hybrid or remote, I have concerns for parents that work and have to put their children in childcare. Uh, what happens if the childcare can't or won't assist with remote learning? Will the children be penalized for missing remote classes? Um, will their grades suffer because of this? As for the hybrid model, I'm not sure if an answer was given, but are all children wearing masks even pre-K through first grade? Because DESE's guidance says pre-K through first grade doesn't have to. Also, how long are the mass breaks? I heard multiple times that when children are doing classwork and seated six feet apart, they would not have to wear a mask. I personally don't think that's safe. I work in a library with only three or four people in the building at once and we wear masks no matter how far apart we are. In stores, you are asked to wear a mask and keep six feet of distance, not one or the other. What about kids running up to a friend or a teacher and forgetting to put their masks back on? Another concern is the anxiety, um, particularly, I mean, all kids experience anxiety, particularly um, sped special education kids. I know my child does. They struggle with anxiety around separations, transitions, new situations, and we've been away from school a very long time. This anxiety can seem like defiance or freezing up, but it is so much more than that. For many students, this anxiety can last months and when handled improperly can last years. And I know that from personal experience. And parents bear the brunt of that change in their children. And we must do all we can to ease children back into school. I keep hearing that there have been no deaths in the zero to 19 age group in Massachusetts. And I, while that's true, there have been roughly 6,600 positive COVID cases in that age group. So yes, it most likely won't die, just maybe get a bit sick, and only some will get seriously ill and have long-term health issues. And of course, some will bring it home to their family members and they could get sick or die. The safety measures, mask, social distancing, the initial closing of schools have all been put in place, not just to protect ourselves, but to protect the spread of COVID and the death of higher risk individuals. I have heard the teacher's concerns and read what the MTA is asking. Teachers know what happens in the classrooms better than anyone. They do not enjoy remote teaching any more than parents do. They love their students and want to see them, but they are telling us the safety precautions put in place are not enough. I would like to see a detailed and greatly improved remote plan with opportunities for outdoor socialization and outdoor learning in school, at school. Finally, I know a lot of work has been put into these plans. And there is no way in our current situation to come up with a plan that has no drawbacks. I appreciate your time and your commitment into making these very difficult decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Um, Jennifer Smith would be the next name I see. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm a fourth grade teacher at DES and I have three children. One will be at DES and two are going to Frontier. And uh, we all know the importance of our kids getting back into the classroom, but there is a certain amount of inevitability to us going into, back into a remote situation at some point. Knowing that and acknowledging that the majority of situations where people have gotten back together result in some level of infections. I'm pleading with you to promise to protect the staff and faculty uh, in our schools so that the kids can be protected. 
please, I'm asking for the school committee to um, clearly let us know that PPEs will be provided, that there will be testing mandated and provided for teachers and staff so that I know, so that we know our kids are going into buildings and going into classrooms from the beginning that are safe. It may not protect us entirely, it may not protect us for the long haul, but it will give us the safety and security and time to connect and build relationships with students so that we can create a better educational experience for them. Please set up testing and PPEs for all teachers and staff. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Kim Salep Poulin. Are you out there, Kim? Yes, I am. Oh, there you uh, are. Hi. I'm a special education teacher at Sunderland, and I would like to preface my comment by saying, along with all of my colleagues here tonight, I would like nothing more than to be in the classroom face to face with my students, teaching them in our school building. But I think that we are romanticizing what that will look like in the reality of our global health crisis. Under the hybrid model, school will not at all look or feel like what our children experienced prior to March 13, 2020. Going through updated Department of Education guidance online again this morning, here are some phrases that gave me pause. All students should have assigned seating in each class. For high touch surfaces, cleaning and disinfecting, disinfecting should occur multiple times per day between uses. Remove all soft and cloth-based materials such as rugs, pillows, stuffed animals, and dress-up clothing. Spaces for masks, mask breaks must allow students to be six feet apart. Consider using tape or other markers to identify where students should be. Considering not allowing students to use the bathroom during transition. Sharing materials is discouraged, but when shared, they must be cleaned before being used by other students. Ensure proper removal and placement of masks before eating. Masks should be removed by handling the ties or back areas of the mask once seated. Do not touch the outside or inside of the part covering the face. While eating, masks should be placed on a napkin, paper towel, or other container on the table with the inside of the mask facing up. This is not school as our children left it. A lot of talk has been taking place about the negative social and emotional impacts of distant learning, but the type of learning that is being discussed happening in our school buildings come fall in a hybrid model sounds like it could be pretty traumatic for our children as well. Remote learning is hard, hard on families, hard on students, hard on teachers. But we know without a doubt, remote learning is the safest option. When there is an option, why would we endanger the progress we are making in Massachusetts? Endanger the lives of our children, of teachers and staff, and of extended families with a whole host of issues to which all these people will return home. Until we are closer to a vaccine or other science-based resolutions to this potential fatal public health crisis, such reckless endangerment makes no sense at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kim. Uh, next I have, is it Aja or Ahaz Seron? Seron? Hi, I'm Asia Cerrone and Asia. I co-chair the CPAC. Um, the needs of our CPAC families vary widely. Um, one plan isn't going to fit all of our special education students' needs, just like one plan didn't fit before the pandemic. We are urging the school committee to uphold the DESE guidelines to prioritize special education services, while also understanding that regardless of what plan is voted in, major modifications on the systemic and individual levels will be needed to meet those guidelines. While we're still in the midst of all this chaos, it's hard to think about when life returns to normal. But I would like you guys to consider the long-term impacts on special education students. Many will require extra services and supports to get back on track for years to come. 
We hope that you will be able to ensure those services are readily available when this is all over. Clearly, there's no perfect solution, but we do appreciate the time and effort you're all putting into making the best of a tough situation. Thank you. Thank you, Aja. Uh, Julie Wagner, I believe Julie, for those that don't know, I think I saw correspondence from Julie today uh, mm -hmm. that you should all take a look at when you have a chance, as yeah. well as, go ahead. Yeah. So, Julie. Okay, I believe I'm on camera. Can you see me? Yes, you are. All right, I'm going to read the correspondence that I sent. Um, I'm a community member and I am the spouse of a Union 38 educator. And I've watched a number of these virtual meetings with the MTA, with the school committees, with the staff and administrators. And first of all, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of me, my heart for what you do and for how conscientiously you do it. I'm enormously impressed with your dedication and your heart and with the amount of hard work that you've done in putting together three potential plans for reopening. And I'm really grateful that my spouse is a part of this particular educational community. Educators are used to doing a lot with a little. And that's part of my concern while you all valiantly are trying to figure out school reopening. I'm concerned that there was a dangerously inadequate national response to COVID-19, leaving some portions of the country doing well while others are still experiencing escalations of infection. I'm concerned about the impending influx of college and private school students from all over the country or inter nationally, I'm not sure if international students will be coming, honestly, who are in many cases being dropped off by parents who may frequent local businesses or restaurants before leaving and who may or may not abide by protocols. I consider this a real wild card in your planning, in our planning. I'm grateful that Governor Baker has instituted a 14-day mandatory quarantine for anybody coming into Massachusetts from a hot spot. However, our college students, adolescents, or even grown adults at this point known for abiding by the rules. My sense is that it's too early to open. Although our area of Massachusetts has done quite well, there is a recent uptick in infections since phase three of community and business reopenings. And there have, I'm sure you know, been at least 39 people infected at Bay State, Springfield, by a worker who traveled to a hotspot and didn't quarantine afterwards. The CDC suggests that social distancing and mask wearing are the best ways to prevent transmission, and yet this seems like it would be very difficult for elementary age children to adhere to. I know you are all doing your best and there are no perfect answers to this extraordinarily difficult situation. And again, I thank you for all the work you're putting in. It's pretty amazing to watch. But I ask you to consider slowing down rather than starting at a hybrid and then backing off when infection, infections occur. Ugh. Why not start slowly with a robust remote system and open when it is clear that it is safe using public health benchmarks such as 14 consecutive days with no new COVID cases in Hampshire and Franklin County. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Julie. Uh, next on the list is Lisa Gaylor. Hi, thanks. Um, and, and excuse me, Lisa, I just wanted to mention that you also have a, a letter out to the committees, I believe. Did I not right. see your name? Yes. Yes. So. I sent a letter, but I wasn't able to get it to all the committee members. So I'm hoping oh, okay. that um, Ken, you can, or Darius, one of you can send that. Okay. And I really was. Okay. You know, I'll leave that to Darius. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, Donna. I see that Donna just said that she sent it out. So thank you, Donna. Um, I'm not going to read the letter just because mm -hmm. it is quite lengthy. But I wanted to just highlight that um, I don't think that it is safe for us to go back right now. And I do feel that having a robust remote learning model is best. But I also feel like we need to spend some time on that remote learning model. I feel like a lot of time has been spent on that hybrid model. And when we talk about the hybrid model, 
that also includes remote learning. And I feel like that's an area that, um, that has been set aside a little bit. And I feel like that is something that we need to consider. So thank you for taking the time when you have the time to read that letter. And I appreciate all that you're all doing for us. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for your thoughts. Uh, Laura Hannes. Hi, yeah. Hi, my name is Laura Hannes, and I'm the secretary at the Conway Grammar School. I know you all know how much our administration has worked incredibly hard on these three plans that the state asked them to do. Their number one concern is the safety and well-being of the families and staff of this district. I am 100% confident in returning to school in the hybrid model. Uh, am I worried? Yes, I'm worried. I have a 93-year-old father-in-law that I take care of every day, and I'm extremely careful because of him and all of my family members. I believe that anyone in this country that isn't worried about COVID are either lying or have had their head buried in the sand for the last five months. I respect anyone that is not comfortable sending their child to school and i respect all the staff that aren't comfortable with it also all i'm asking is that you all put your trust in our administration that they will make sure they take every precaution for all the safe the safety of all of us thank you thank you laura laura and friend <laughs> uh, heidi bauer clap would like to comment Hello, everyone. I'm the parent of a soon-to-be fourth grader at Sunderland Elementary School, and I have two questions I'd like to hear someone speak to at some point, and if these questions haven't yet been considered, I hope the committees and administration will consider them. My questions are, what specific public health indicators, such as the number of cases or the number of days with no new confirmed cases, are you relying on to determine whether schools will meet in person or remotely? And if schools do meet in person, what public health indicators will you rely on to determine if schools should close again? I also just wanted to thank everyone for their efforts to keep our school communities safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and thanks. Uh, Ryan Copeland would be next. Yes, hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Um, so my name is Ryan Copeland and I teach fifth and sixth grade at Sunderland. Um, and first of all, I want to acknowledge the tremendously difficult decision that we face here and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, and I should go without saying that no matter what school reopening looks like, I know that the teachers and staff of this district, my colleagues will rise to the challenge and, and do our best to deliver quality instruction to all of our students. Um, I just have three points I'd like to share this evening. And the first fits with this theme of things that should go without saying. Um, as you know, the union membership currently supports a robust remote learning plan as the safest way to educate our students in the fall. And here's that phrase again, it, it should go without saying that we are fully cogniz cognizant of the challenges that remote learning poses for many of our students and families, particularly our most vulnerable. After all, we spent countless hours this past spring trying to overcome those challenges texting lengthy tech tutorials to overwhelmed parents, calling and calling, knocking on doors, delivering food, books, and supplies. We were there, we know, and it doesn't need to be explained to us. My second point is that I believe we should be careful about assuming, as, as Kim said earlier, that in-person instruction in this, in this model will automatically be more effective than remote learning. Because after all, the in-person instruction that we would be providing is nowhere near that type of instruction that we know is best practice. Many of the pedagogical techniques that we've spent years crafting and improving are simply not feasible in a classroom environment in which students must stay six feet apart, cannot share supplies, and must remain relatively isolated at their own individual desks. Simply being physically present in the classroom does not on its own lead to effective learning. When considering a hybrid model, I just think that we should ima imagine the challenges that it poses at least as much as we consider the challenges posed by remote learning. My final point is safety. Like many of you, I feel lucky that here in Western Mass, we've avoided the worst of this pandemic. Now, if I were a teacher in Florida right now, facing the prospect of returning to school in three weeks, I don't know what I would, would do or be thinking. 
Um, and so while we're relatively safe and protected here, I do think it's important to acknowledge that there's still so much that we don't know about this virus. Um, I saw an article from a reputable newspaper recently in which um, public health officials in Florida are seeing lung damage in children who had COVID-19, including kids who are asymptomatic or had very mild symptoms. So no matter how little we think the risk of returning to in-person instruction may be, it is still a risk. And no matter which reopening plan you support and which plan you may want, it is still simply a fact that returning to in-person instruction is a risk that we don't have to take because there is an alternative. And I believe that that's an important distinction to make. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> Erica Parker. Is Erica out there somewhere? I don't know if she's muted. Okay, I am here, I'm sorry. I'm on a phone and I was muted. Can you hear me? Now yes. we can hear you, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I am an IA at Deerfield in fifth and sixth grade. And my comment really piggybacks a lot on top of um, Lisa Gaylor's and also Ryan's that we just heard that I also feel for a lot of the reasons that have already been mentioned that starting out remote would be the safest way to proceed. And that I wanted to speak a little bit to the remote learning experience that we had in the spring and like everybody else, I am very aware of all of the challenges and I experienced challenges, but I also experienced remote learning that worked well. I ran some small groups for students for phonics and math. These were fifth and sixth graders. And I actually felt that as time went on, I came up with a lot of methods in conjunction with other teachers and talking about it. We came up with methods that worked. And that some of my students actually really thrived in this remote model. It can work. Um, I had, we did some extra math instruction for sixth graders who wanted to go above and beyond. We, some of them did projects and presented their learning to their peers. Um, I also was engaged in some whole group class Google Meets where I was kind of just as I would be in the classroom, I was a support for the classroom teacher so that I could monitor the chat box and I could give students reminders of expected behavior. I could also type into the chat box when I noticed that a student had said or done something that was exceptional and give them a little shout out. And functioning just as an IA would, I felt in the classroom. And the teachers that I did this with said that they felt supported by me and that they felt that this was a great role for an IA in remote learning to run the small groups and then to support teachers in these full groups. And if I feel if we were to go back fully remotely so that we could really be focusing on getting a, a very robust remote plan going, we could find more roles for IAs, ways that, that IAs can loop in and really support the teachers and really make this strong, good as, as good as we can possibly make it, remote learning experience. Because I felt like we really did have successes in the spring and I saw some of my students really doing well and really being able to be comfortable, not have anxiety about the virus because they were at home and really being able to get into the, the remote learning and do what they needed to do. So that was, I just wanted to point out that there were some positives, even though there were challenges, there were positives to remote learning too. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, I see one last name and then I will, I will be closing uh, public comment. I, Megan Tudrin, were you interested in making a comment or did you just sign in? I don't know which, it just popped up on my screen. Comment. Yep. Go ahead, Megan. You can need to unmute if you uh, have not done so, Megan. Sorry Make about comment. that. It took me a while. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say I have a little bit of a different side. I am an ER nurse, a school nurse, and a contact tracing nurse for COVID-19. And several months ago, I was afraid. I was afraid to come home from work to my children. I was afraid to expose my high-risk parents. I was afraid that I would get sick and leave my children motherless. However, things have changed. I'm no longer afraid. I've learned that with proper PPE, we can be safe. 
I've been face to face with COVID patients and I was okay. And that's because I was using the tools that were given to us. And these are not just N95 masks. I've taken care of patients with surgical masks. As long as I was doing proper hand washing and following the guidelines, I was okay. So <laughs> I, I feel like as long as we get enough training and we follow the safety regulations and follow the state guidelines, that we could be okay too. And that everyone's fears might start to diminish if we take that plunge. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, so that will uh, wrap up the public comments that I have seen on the screen here. Um, Christine O'Connell just put her name in. Did you want to say something, Christine? <laughs> this will be absolutely the last person. Are you out there, Christine? Need to unmute if you want to comment. She's trying to. Oh, she's trying to. Okay. Was it Darius? Was that control something for her? Control D is the shortcut. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm here. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm a parent of a student going into first grade. Um, I'm also work in healthcare. And I have a similar experience to Megan, like going back to work was very difficult. And I think everybody going back to work had a certain element of fear. But I also think we have a lot of tools and we have a lot of knowledge and we know how we can prevent COVID at this point. Um, it's not perfect, but um, there's been lots of success in Massachusetts. Um, our transmission rates are pretty low. And I think generally things are looking pretty good. I think generally we definitely still need to be very cautious, but also we have to look at um, other factors with our kids and with our families. Um, we've all been asked to go back to work generally. Um, and there's also a lack of childcare. A lot of families aren't able to teach their kids at home effectively. Um, and I think no matter when we go back, it's gonna be difficult for teachers and staff and um, just know that it's always going to be scary. And I think it's a, a smart thing to have um, a certain element of fear. But I'd also ask the school committee to look at, um, at families and their needs. Because um, there's parents with two working parents um, who don't have any options for time off to be at home with their kids when they remote learn, or even with the hybrid model. So, um, I just want them to consider that at this point, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of support for families in our communities. And I know that's not necessarily a school responsibility, but um, hopefully uh, we can take that into consideration and hopefully maybe the government can provide some support if um, a remote model or a hybrid model is chosen. But thank you for everybody's um, time and consideration. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Christine. So I think that will wrap up the public comment phase. Uh, we will be moving on the agenda to a general summary or and, you know further review and discussion of the draft reviews of the plans. Uh, Darius will be taking over. Before we, before we do that, I'd like to do a couple of things though. I'd like to thank um, my colleague, David Sharp, for chairing the meeting last the last meeting in my absence, I apologize for not being there. I've had a chance to watch the, the uh, video and, and get a sense as to how effectively uh, you did a great job for me, David. I want to say thank you. And I also want to thank Bob Holla for taking the, taking the reins on the superintendent evaluation summary and getting that through, through in the last meeting as well. So I, I really do appreciate it. This, uh, this has been a, doesn't seem like a, a long summer, but it's obviously been a very long summer for our, our administration, um, for you, all of you on the school committees, for all of the parents and concerned community members that are joining this meeting tonight and, and listening and participating, for all the people who have participated in the town meetings. All of this information is, is very welcome to everyone that's working on this and will have to ultimately make a decision. We still have three weeks. I mean, we still have three or four weeks to go before uh, we would be 
quote, reopening schools in some manner, shape, or form, one of the three models. And I think much will be told in those three weeks as we watch the health situation and see what's transpiring. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's no, no crystal ball. So I appreciate everyone's concerns. I appreciate all those who have had loved ones who um, have, have suffered from COVID-19, who have lost friends or relatives. Uh, my heart goes out to all of you, and uh, we'll get through this. I appreciate all of you being here tonight. So with that, Darius, it's, it's all yours. Um, <clears throat> thanks. So I guess basically, you know, I don't, this is, as far as the, Holly asked a question, is the school committee voting on a plan tonight? No, um, this is a discussion, um, a discussion period to have uh, for the school committee to ask questions, um, hear feedback. I, mean, I saw a lot of the school committee at the town halls. As was said, we had, I think, seven town halls because we did one twice. Um, you know, with about, I think on each town hall, there was over, over 100 participants in each town hall. So we, really, there was a lot of outreach to community. Um, and getting a lot of good questions out there um, and such. So really the, the process here again is that school committee is scheduled to um, vote on this next week. It is their, it is their schedule. They're wel welcome to change it, um, but we kind of had to kind of set out the, uh, the, uh, the plans here. Um, so, you know, I think the, the rule is set about not putting comments in the side things because I feel like I have to answer those comments. So it's you know, not a, uh, it's not a chat line there. Um, you know, moving forward, uh, the other question was, um, you know, I don't know how, what the school committee wants to do. I sent out, you know, what I'll do is I'll post it in the chat, people, so the public can see what has been sent out as an update <clears throat> to, that, to the, basically, for hybrid and the remote learning plan. Um, this is the latest link that was sent out um, um, to the, the school committee yesterday. Um, basically, and I can kind of walk through it, but it's basically what was shared at the um, at the town hall meetings, and so going through that. So, do you want me to just quick uh, do a quick glance through that, Ken? Is that what, what you'd like to see? Yes, please. Oh. I'm just yes, up, I'm reading through. I'm just going to hit the highlights of it. That was me. So basically, folks at home, you can also just you know click on that link and, and and see it. But basically, kind of the overall view of this is is this kind of the hybrid the hybrid model. And the all coming back is one I think we put that aside, even though the state has recommended that you know we do three models. I don't think that's realistic. I think just in the discussion you hear tonight, I think we're too far away in the feelings of um, in the feelings and perceptions of people that you know really all coming back is not really on the table. I think we're really either looking at a hybrid model or um, you know, a remote model. And so the hybrid model in, in a basic overview, you know, the state did come out yesterday um, officially notifying. I think some, there was some leaking of that that was going to happen a few days prior, but um, that the school year will start 10 days later. Um, the, the MTA has negotiated taking away, shortening the school year by 10 school days and giving 10 of those school days for teaching of, uh, training of teachers. So the school year will be shortened overall and the amount of hours on learning will be shortened overall. So um, those, that phase zero is those teacher is that teacher training. Um, right now, we go back to school um, officially according to the contract on the 26th. And so basically you're talking about the first day of school, whether it be remote or in person, it being like the 11th, 10th or 11th there. Um, in my planning to the school committee, I am gonna um, work with the unions to discuss you know, um, the first day of starting because we can talk about starting a few days earlier with those professional developments. Um, and so, you know, I will bring the calendar to be voted at the next school committee as well. Okay. So basically we're, you know, the, the, the hybrid rollout would be an orientation in the first week, um, maybe two or three days of bringing families to the buildings um, with their children to go through orientations, um, also providing remote orientations as well. Phase one is bringing people um, in alternating um, you know, the AB model, bringing in half the students at a time. Um, with learning remotely on the opposite time um, and starting with half days of school. Um, we're worried about, you know, we really needed to look at um, the afternoons um, for professional development to alter what's going well and what's not going well in those opening days of school. I put a little asterisk on this because this has been updated since I sent it out yesterday in the sense that 
How many of those days do we need, I think can be still be discussed because really we were looking at a lot of professional development having on those half days. Now with the 10 days given at the beginning of the school year, professional will need as many half days. So maybe we're looking maybe at one week or four sessions of school at the half day. Um, might be something that we modify from going to one week um, from the two weeks. Um, and then phase two, um, an AB model, um, again, um, expanding to full days, um, going for about four weeks. And then after that, you know, can we expand going into the Wednesday uh, model, uh, the Wednesday? So let me kind of give a picture. If you can kind of, those you can sneak around yourselves, but those who don't, um, let me put it here. <coughs> Here's the, um, you know, what it would look like, you know, the, the phase one, you know, where you see the alternating happening. Um, and then I believe we have a phase two. Um, again, with the Wednesdays being remote learning and then the PD in the afternoon. Um, and then eventually taking over that Wednesday and rotating that into a into part of the rotation. So some students will be in three days, one week and two days, and then the following weekend, three days. So, so overall, that's the, uh, you know, then, and, and also, we also were looking at, we've heard a lot from the parents regarding childcare and what can the school do. As soon as we have a, a, a plan set, we're gonna start looking at it by school, about if there's anything we can do out of the gate, help with childcare. Um, and then really within our planning, we we're talking about at phase three, you know, looking at opening up extended day for the school to, you know, maybe all. Um, but again, you know, that's kind of be, you know, based on need and, and how the numbers look at each school. Because one of the issues that we have is we don't know the numbers of, you know, we did the survey to parents um, and that is, let me pull that up. Basically, I'm gonna scroll down, sorry if this make anybody dizzy, but basically, um, if we move forward with an in-person model this fall, my child is, is planning on participating, you know, basically yes or probably yes. Put us, you know, um, if we can look down here, yes and probably yes, you know, 46 and 34, you know, so you're basically close to just over 80, um, just around 80% um, there. And then no at, at 6% and probably no at 20%. So and that kind of comes down if, when we wrote this next question, are, I'm only interested in remote education at this time. And you're seeing the numbers at, um, you know, 16 is only interested in remote and 83 is interested in some sort of in-person. So, um, you know, that was the, that we got in that initial. Again, that was a snapshot in time. I mean, I know people's ideas around this may be um, changing. Um, let me go back to the, um, but um, some of our planning also is dependent on how many students we have in each, in each model and how many people are choosing to be remote if we're doing a remote and hybrid model, um, and that could also affect how we can provide childcare um, as well. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. The, um, <clears throat> so that's kind of where, kind of a quick overview. Is there questions from the committee on that? Um, I know it's moving quickly, but you also can bring on your, your own screen and rather than me read out loud to you something that's not always the best. Um, uh, Darius, we, we have a question from Ainsley Jackson uh, asking, will AB remote coordinate only siblings in elementary school or will there be some coordination between elementary, middle and high school? <laughs> I know it's probably still a little too early to be yeah, asking we, the question, but the question right, is we, there. We discussed that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to see that we, we will be able to try to accommodate, but there are so many moving parts, especially when you go into the high school. Because um, mm -hmm. there's so many different course offerings, and the way we're going to right now look at dividing the high school and middle school up is by last name. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, Sarah, if you want to, I saw you out there, Sarah, if you want to jump in and interrupt me at any point, you're welcome to. But, you know, can we have an appeals process that isn't, doesn't make things go crazy? I think that could be considered. You know, we get 100 appeals, then we may not, you know, it's like trying to give, but, you know, but within reason. Because um, I know sometimes the older older siblings are, you know, um, getting them on the same time scale can provide um, care at home. Sarah, do you, you any yeah. other thoughts on that? Yeah, so we had exactly that conversation this afternoon while we were really looking at our schedule is um, the coordination because we understand how vital 
older siblings can be sometimes to elementary siblings in a household, especially if you're looking at childcare. And we came to exactly the same conclusion that you just said, Darius, that if we had a few requests here and there that we could accommodate, that that's what we're gonna try to do. Um, and, but if we get an overwhelming number of requests for switching of the AB hybrid, um, then we're just going to reach a point because of the number of moving parts where um, we're going to be limited in how much we can do. But we, we're going to make our best try to accommodate as many people as we can, um, but understanding the complexities of it. And then in the elementary school, the larger buildings can, you know, they're not going to all the, you know, the, they may not have all the first grades on the same day. They can have, they can alternate and then move the siblings so they're in the same day. The smaller schools are looking at um, when I say the smaller schools, Wheatley and Conley, we only have one grade per level. You know, they're, they're looking where they may, it may not be two, three, five on one day in um, one, whatever numbers I was saying. On the other, on the opposite day, they may be able to reorganize it to have the most sibling coverage over the, the two days. It's not going to be perfect. Someone's going to be a, a loser in the, in the, in the stacking of it, but we're going to probably go by statistically who, how many, the most families we can help within that model. Hey, um, Darius, go ahead, uh, yeah, I just wanted to jump on in that document. If you keep scrolling down, there's a lot of information on remote learning. And as you know, in a hybrid model, remote learning is key, right? We're alternating with something and the something is remote learning. And in there, there are some basic edicts of what we want to do to improve that process. And we are working hard. We have been from the beginning to really look at that remote learning design. And there's a lot of structured professional development. There's train the trainer teams. There's all kinds of things that are going into that to make it a quality education. We have to look at that component as rich and robust to move children forward for positive outcomes on so many different levels. So to think that we are just looking at it at one side, I wanted to show you the work that's coming into this at the elementary school and the work that needs to be done. And um, feedback is is greatly appreciated for that, but I don't want you to think that we've been just looking at it through this AB kind of thing. What are the components that we do in the AB parts of the education? Um, and so I, I obviously I, I scrolled down there, but people can log on, can click onto that link and go down there. I was just trying to show where it was. <clears throat> I think Kim brings up a good point. We, we've been talking so much about the hybrid model. We haven't been talking about the improvement of the remote, the remote model. Um, and we are leaning to do a lot of improvement, a lot of um, synchronous learning, strong schedules. So it isn't just, you know, when you can get on the computer. Students have to be accountable to when and where they're logging on. Teachers are going to be accountable to where they are when they're logging on and how things are going to be delivered. Um, so there's gonna be a lot more, a lot more has to be, be put into there. You know, we're, you know, unfortunately due to, you know, there's only so many of us, we had to kind of push forward with a, you know, we had to get the hybrid model so people could be comfortable about looking at about what it means. And then we're also at the same time looking at the remote model. So um, no matter what, there's gonna be improvement on, um, you know, for those remote learners from what the spring did, the spring didn't have the level of accountability the state is expecting. And I think quite frankly what we're expecting um, this fall. So, um, it might be a good time to bring up Schoology, Darius. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, um, Kim, Kim, excuse, Kim, just excuse me one second. I think Michael Merritt had a question first. Then you could talk about Schoology. Um, certainly, Michael, did you want to ask a question? Are you muted, Michael? Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm unmuted now. There we go. Um, and I was also looking in the chat. Um, and about eight minutes ago, um, Marty Nichols asked, "Is are the school committees voting to accept the three-part plan, or are we voting to pick one of the options? And I just wanted to hear the clarification on that. And then I still have the actual question I had. So, well, You're voting next week on one of the plans. Okay. I don't think, so, it, I mean, I have to submit all plans to DESE. I don't, I'm not sure if you have to vote or not. I could double check that, but it's, a, right. you know, I don't think they care which ones we don't accept. They care about which ones we do. Right. So all three, all three plans go to DESE. So next, a week from today, we are deciding on one plan. Correct. Thank you. Um, 
So my question relates to the um, document that you shared uh, and also put in the chat here. Could, could someone bring up, um, I'm trying to think of which page it is. It's in the technology update toward the beginning of the plan. It says, um, remote learning is an integral component of the hybrid model and extensive state guidance is summarized in the remote learning section below. Here, please find an update on our district's technology. Is anybody able to present that section? It's, toward, it's very close to the top. Okay. Do you know a page so I can go to that page? It's like page one or two. Okay. <clears throat> um, yeah, there it is, technology. It says that, sorry, my dog's barking here. It was, it was start right when you're about to DS on the microphone. Um, it says each school is investigating the need for and setup of internet cafes for students with internet access barriers. Um, that my question is, does that apply to only the hybrid model or does that also apply to the remote only model? I like to really had an answer. I saw Kim nodding. <laughs> yeah, it, it applies to both. It applies to both. So access to quality education is key. And so if, if there are barriers with bandwidth, if there are significant barriers, we have to have a way to help children access quality education. So um, kind of a follow-up question about that is um, our are families aware, like what is the level of need? If, let's say a family doesn't want a student to participate in the classroom environment um, where there's say 15 students in a room, but they would feel safer if their student was at a internet cafe supported area of the building and they were participating remotely, kind of like from a cubicle. Like, what's the what's the threshold for for that decision? I guess in terms of need. Like like everything, it's in progress, and I know Darius has a lot of ideas on that, but. Um, we don't have like the capacity for a cubicle, so you would picture a classroom with children in there, and uh, and it. All these different ways, and in a, in a sense, there are other gates, right, that we need to open. Those parameters are being defined as we work forward in this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see that Maureen Nichols has asked, has any consideration been given to starting with a remote plan and possibly changing to a hybrid plan if COVID numbers are consistently low over a period of time? So, I mean, we can go any direction the committee steers us. The idea that we had was currently our numbers are low. I don't know how much lower they're going to get in the COVID world before a vaccination. And, and maybe they'll spike. You know, we, there's, we saw the thing that happened down at Bay State. Hopefully they get that under control and can trace that down and, and, and stop it there. Um, but so I, I guess my question is if when at what point, what is going to be the indicator? And I'll talk a little bit about those indicators because I know someone's going to ask that question too. Um, what is going to be the indicator if we do remote of when it's safe to go back? And then, then I would also ask the school committee, if we do a remote model, you know, at what point is it remote for the year? Um, and so on and so forth there, because there's, there's a lot of questions that would, that would, that would go there as well. So um, <clears throat> Kim, you wanted to jump in on that as well. Is that what you're asking comment on that? I want to cycle back to technology, so I'll wait. I just don't want to get lost in the shuffle because what I need to say is really important. I don't want to scare okay. anybody wrong. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so um, right now, so looking at the markers within our, you know, I've been in touch with our local board of health, and I have a meeting with them tomorrow morning as well. Um, our our bi-week, our weekly meeting, it's turned to bi-weekly meetings, um, to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, what are the indicators? I'd like to see a regional indicator, not just each town have its own indicator that we're all kind of on the same page and not just the four towns, but you know, I was actually talking with another superintendent just down the road who was also looking for the same idea as well, because we can't be all be making up these different matrix based on 
what level of you know medical advice. And so those numbers are still coming. We do have that 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 the kind of the protocols for um, you know students with possible COVID or with COVID in there. You know there is some talk about you know these indicators with more to come, and that's why it's there. We're still that's still a live thing because we need. I can't just make that up. I can't say two and a half percent, five percent. You know, there's all these different percentages that you could kind of do based on based on what number, you know, based on what resource, you know, that kind of thing. We all have to kind of collectively agree what that is. And, you know, my, one of my things is that will be part of the presentation next week is I have to have that clear for you all of you as well. I think the, the superintendents as well are talking about it. We're all in the same boat. Nobody has a crystal clear way. Some have a better me a lead ahead of us because they're looking at you know looking at some certain databases but um, i want that to be also in it also has to be agreed upon by the board of health okay and and they have to have an understanding because they're ultimately the ones who are going to have to approve those markers if we're marking health off of that so a lot of different moving parts there so i think that answers i think holly had that question um, earlier as well as you know what makes you go from one thing to the, the other as well so <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Kim, did you want to make your comment now or should I go to Katie's question um, first? I just want to um, make it really quickly just to move on. In the beginning, in the 713 uh, draft plan, there was um, the idea of the elementary schools moving towards Schoology for the learning management plan. And the decision was made yesterday that we're not moving towards using that, we will use Google Enterprise instead. And I want to get that information out to school committee and the folks that are here listening, because I know a lot of people are spending time looking and thinking and going in different directions. So it's really to clarify and to communicate and partner with everyone that the elementary school will not be using Schoology and that we will be staying with Google Enterprise. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to uh, email me. Thanks, Kim. Um, Darius, Katie um, has asked or has a comment slash question. Given the importance of creating routines for young children, the AB, the AB elementary schedules seem choppy and may be hard for families to keep straight. Speaking from experience when the early release days went from every Friday to just some Fridays. Understanding that the scheduling is tricky, can you explain why the elementary schedules are alternating by the day rather than versus alternating Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday in schools, in school days or other options? Yeah, so we, 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 did, we did discuss this, and I, I can see Kim nodding hard. She's going to jump in, too, because she was kind of the leader of the discussion with, this, the, with the principals, um, is the fact that the, the inconsistency, the, there's more consistency the day on, day off with the being in person rather than um, you know, starting up doing two days and then doing two days remote. You, this way you can have reflection from the remote learning. A lot of the hybrid model, the positive side is that we're going to be teaching students how to do remote learning because the teacher's going to be able to check in with them in person on the following day. And so, and that goes back to the question about, I think I, don't, I didn't answer it. And please, you know, sometimes I get off track. And if I don't answer a question, call me on that, please. Um, but I do, do a lot of talking. Um, that goes to the question of like, why aren't we doing remote first and then going into and then going into a hybrid thing? And the yeah. idea is once again is not only just those numbers, but there is this concern of a second wave when flu season comes in, in November, and that if we can get some in-person instruction, get some instruction around how to do remote learning um, with these with these you know, few days each week in person that would strengthen that. And the other, other, every other day model within that is so that you can meet with the students, the next day you're seeing them online, going through it, and then you're falling back up rather than these kind of clumps in time where you feel like you're restarting from a long weekend. Um, and it's kind of, there's more consistency in the every other day. Um, that was the thought there. I know some other schools are looking at the model of um, Monday, Tuesday, break in the middle, and then Thursday, Friday, with the, you know, the swapping of it that way. Um, you know, quite frankly, you know, it's, uh, Kim, you want to go a little bit more? Did I miss any kind of points on that? Yes. Um, it, everything that Darius said, and I, it feels like a lifetime ago, but uh, in June, we had all these multiple committees with committee members from a wide sector working on these ideas. And at least three committees came to the same conclusion, the operation, the curriculum, and the social emotional wellness committee around the idea of doing this every other day for multiple reasons, um, including 
all the things that Darius said through an academic lens, but also through a connection lens and promoting learning in multiple models. So I, I want to let you know that it's been diced and sliced and considered by many, many brains. And uh, this is what they moved forward, what we, we moved forward as a way to really support the children across grade levels. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Is, is the Google Enterprise going to have a schedule that people can reference and be able to really quickly see where does my child need to be today? Um. You betcha. <laughs> That's the biggest area that we need to really improve. Sorry, Darius. It, 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 there are so many different things that are coming and communication consistency routine is part of the thing that has to really be moved to the forefront in partnering with parents, parent workshops, parent resources, uh, you know, troubleshooting hotlines, if you will, tech hotlines, all of those pieces are important. But what is equally or maybe more so, and I don't know how to, or how we want to look at it is live learning, whole group, small group, individuals, uh, really getting in, helping students set goals, reflecting on their goals, working within academic content and priority standards, assessing to children, the accountability, the attendance taking, it just, it goes on and on. And there's some basic foundational things that were written in there. There's three areas of professional development that we want to do. Classroom management, student engagement is one, family communication and outreach, and instructional design. Those are the three areas that we're really working on. And all of those take consistency and um, organization and clarity in partnering with parents and students mm -hmm. and teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we have a question from Kristen Gordon. Hi, um, Darius and Kim. I just I just wanted to let you know that I actually see Katie's question. And so I think what I think what Katie's thinking is that we're rotating days. So she's asking, like, why aren't we going with like, a, oh, no, sorry, Katie, misread that. Quiet. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's gotcha. Crystal Gordon for those who are in other districts. <laughs> I won't say what school she's at. <laughs> it's, uh, it isn't it's Katie. Eighteen hour day. Sorry. <laughs> oh me. So things are getting confusing. So um, any other? Qu oh, Michael Merritt. During phase one half days, will the remote days also be half? Uh, yes, yes, because we're going to need them all for professional development <coughs> in the afternoon. But again, we looked at that when we realized we didn't have a lot of professional development time. We were trying to work that into the schedule. So now, you know, we, we're looking at probably a week less of those half days because we need less professional development. Um, we're we're getting, I mean, it's a little bit of a guessing about how much we're going to need to do, but 10 days is a lot of professional development time that we can hopefully um, get the routines kind of established and um, then just really edit them the first few, um, few days, and then hopefully they're in place by then. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Jessica Corwin. Yeah, so my question um, is sort of about process. So, Darius, you brought up the public health benchmarks that we're going to need to talk about next week. I know the MTA is still negotiating with Commissioner Riley, and that's one of the three demands that they still have. So we might get some um, we might get some metrics from the state. Um, we might not, or they might not be appropriate for our more rural setting. Um, I'm the idea of only discussing what those exact metrics are in the meeting where we're voting on them sounds to me like our uh, questionable process for having a public hearing on the budget and then immediately voting. It doesn't give the, the public any time to weigh in on what those metrics are. Um, could we make some sort of a plan to um, make public a draft of those metrics one, two, three days before our next meeting? Sure. That's sure. I mean, the draft of it right now, it, it, you know, out there um, in the plan is talking about it's basically what is the percentage of case increase and whether or not um, right now, I think we have it in there at 2.5. Um, you know, I've seen other plans where I have it at 5%. And the question is in our community, what makes more sense? And I'll be honest with you, I got to kind of reach out to the Board of Health to really understand, you know, when you start talking about percentages and you talk about more rural communities, percentages look very differently than in a $100,000 100, person city. 
you know, so, you know, it's, uh, so I want to make sure that the, they, they line up, but we can absolutely post them ahead of time. Um, as you know, as well, we can kind of do we'll try to do one package. That, that would be great. I feel like that for me, that is just right now the most important question about this. Um, for, for those, I don't know all of the school committee members from the other towns very well. I'm, I'm an elementary school teacher. I've been doing it for 15 years, and I just have this very fundamental sense that expecting children to be masked and socially distanced all day is really not developmentally appropriate for many of them, um, and that expecting them to be masked and distanced and ready to learn all day strikes me as really unreasonable. And I think that that's what we're hearing from the teachers. Um, so although masks and distancing work, I don't think that they should be our primary defense against transmission. I think that having a safer, broader landscape medically is the way to go. And so I would really like to be able to have a thorough discussion with public input on that particular topic. Sure, thank you. Um, let's see. Diane Cassidy. If you're out there, you're apparently still muted. If you wanted to try and unmute, you can ask your question. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, if I read correctly, the elementary schools are a Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday with a development day on Wednesday, and then middle and high school their development day is on Friday. Is there any way that we could have them on the same day between the two schools? So that the development days would be, you know, every Wednesday for middle and elementary. Cause I mean, I'm a school choice family and I have one in, in two different schools. And I just want to say thank you for all of your hard work. Sure. Thank you, Diane. Does anyone have an answer to that question? I'm trying to figure out where you're pulling that information from because they are they are the same. Right now we have the Wednesdays as the middle day. And then right. if you're looking at the phase three plan, that's when we start to um, we we swallow up that Wednesday and we start going three days on um, three and two and then alternating weeks after that. So that may be where the confusion is there. Oh, okay. I, I was trying to juggle all of that and I couldn't figure out which part was middle school, which part was elementary right. school. Okay. But right. no. I, can see if you, I can see if you didn't see the phase though, you'd think that like it's their different schedule because it, it shows the afternoon. They could be remote learning on Friday. Um, there. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. We have a question from Sean O. Can we consider a public hearing or special town meeting on this? It is a very important issue. Um, You're looking at this special town meeting. I mean, the, the school committees have, this is their authority. This is their job. I know right. they don't, probably don't want it right now. Um, <laughs> and the, the scheduling is right here. We're having a, we did town meetings to get information out to parents and kind of get them and encourage them to come this evening to talk to school committee members, give their ideas. Um, that's why we're doing this information session so everybody can get their thoughts and, and ideas out to the school committee so they can consider them. And then we can go into next week. The school committee, you are welcome to have more meetings if you, if you, if you desire or if you, you know, want to want to do anything within that, you're certainly welcome to, but I think this is the idea. This is the, this is the town meeting, so to speak. On that. Right. So you're, well, let me, let me ask a question, Darius, uh, or just a, and Phil, I'll get to you in one second. Um, I, as I as I sit and, and think about all the you know all the various issues that are being raised and, and talked about here, um, this the hybrid plan with the phasing is is a plan that um, I think answers or not answers but it tries to address a lot of the questions I hear. There's there's a great deal of uncertainty with whatever decision we ultimately make, and I, there's no best model. There's no right answer. Um, there probably are many wrong answers, but uh, to me, there's no 100% uh, guaranteed answer to any of this. Um, the, the phased model that's been presented brings uh, the students back in, initially and um, 
for as long as the schools deem necessary on on almost what I consider well half days, um, getting getting used to things in the schools, and it allows the teachers to uh, work on their remote learning as well as their in in class learning and getting everyone into routines and safety practices and protocols. Um, so I mean th that's. You know, that's to me is a benefit of the model, and it can be taken as fast or as slow as the health condition, the pandemic conditions surrounding us. Um, and remote learning is indeed a safer one, and we've obviously made great strides in remote learning, or, or we'll have, you know, we've had the opportunity to look at what happened, what worked, and what didn't work in the spring, and, uh, you know, start to build protocols and, and systems to really ramp up remote learning. Um, so, I mean, these are all, these are all great questions. Um, we do have to make some kind of a decision by next week, but my real question, Darius, is we make a decision next week. There are still areas, you know, such as the indicators that we'll be using going forward that will still need to be ratcheted down over the ensuing weeks, and we would be considering additional possible changes to the plans, correct? So, yeah, I, I think I'm hearing, you know, I, was, I was hearing from Jessica, she'd really like to see those indicators for next week, and I'll do my best to get them there. Um, like I said, we I was in conversations with, the, actually, um, with Carol Ness today, and then there's a Board of Health meeting, um, at least area meeting tomorrow, where I'm going to bring it up again to talk about, um, you know, help on that area. Also, the Superintendent, you know, communication of a meeting tomorrow. It's on the agenda as well. So for, for Western Mass Superintendent, so I, I hopefully I'll have that answer there. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to adjust this 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 thing moving forward. And obviously, if COVID changes, that's going to change our direction as well, um, because the whole idea is to have a model that's going to be fluid to go from, you know, uh, some sort of in person and, and back to remote. Um, you know, within that model, um, I guess the if we go to the uh, if we go to remote only model, I guess the the, the thing I, I am I'm serious to ask the, the, the question to the school committee is do you have to give me direction on when how do we look to come back um, and what is the indicators are there going to be I just it just has to be clear because there's going to be budgetary inclinations like how much do I staff do I staff for a remote model or am I staffing for a hybrid model and right, you know right. keeping you know, we have a lot of employees that that don't need to be they aren't as necessary if everybody's at home. And so are we are we holding on to them for a few months as we try to roll this out? Are we saying we're gonna go with that for six? So let's just talk about the remote for a minute, I guess. So are we holding, you know, are we saying we're going six months? So therefore, you know, I gotta make the budgetary decisions to say, you know what, we're gonna have to let those good, lay people off until they're needed again, um, that kind of thing. So we're gonna to have to, if we decide to go the remote thing, I want people to be thinking about that because we have to have a decision about how long are we remote for the whole year. And we're gonna just, you know, kind of stay, that put the, you know, foot in the stand and say, you know what, this is what we believe to be the best course of action. And then at the same time, set the schools to be a remote only model moving <laughs> forward, you know, and then also understand we have a whole special education op obligation and vulnerable student obligation. So some of these students have to come back where we have to go out and, in, in, and give some support, some services, if it's in person or like there. Um, I don't know if Karen's on, um, if Karen's available or even, even Kim, you, know, you can talk a little more eloquently than I can about that. But we have obligations under the state, the state uh, law that we're, you know, we're reopening that we have to provide those services. And you can't just do those remotely. Um, we have students that you, you know, can't access learning through a screen. Um, so those are all the other things that we're gonna have to consider as well that we, we, we do either model. You know, I'm being great. We can do either model. And, you know, obviously, I told you from the beginning, I am pushing um, the one that right now is, 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 is making people more uncomfortable because it is, it's easier to say, let's just do remote. You know what I mean? The harder thing is, like, how do we restart the system? How do we get kids back in the building? And how do we do it safely? So, okay. Uh, Phil, Phil Cantor. Hey. Yeah, hi. Um, so I just first of all, just uh, regarding the previous question about um, uh, possibly getting a town meeting together. So just to let people know, um, it's in the state constitution, I believe, and also states you have a right to convene a town meeting by petition. 
in all four of our states, um, uh, all four of our towns. And I don't, I don't know what the signature hurdle is, but um, that's that anybody can do that over any issue. I would caution people that uh, danger that way lies just, just, in, just to the extent that, you know, whenever you ask a question or have a decision being made at an annual town meeting, um, you are inviting the majority of people there to make a decision. And the majority of people there are not part of the school community and do not um, have kids in the schools. So um, that's, that's a potentially perilous course to get any type of uh, school policy decided, in my opinion. But anybody has the right to do it. It's true. Um, it's done with its decision with a sledgehammer and not a scalpel. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, um, and, and, and then just just, you know, the, the, uh, just a, a few of the other comments just about um, kind of what they'd like to see. Uh, I, when I was listening to Jessica's comments, I, I, I thought to, to myself that this is this is just one of these types of meetings that it's hard for me to sit through just to the point that it's like parliamentary procedure does it all injustice. That you know that that you that you wish, um, yeah, that, that that you wish that uh, you know that, that that people could um, have all of their questions answered to their satisfaction, even if they don't like the answers. Um, but there's 114 people, and I understand that that's not exactly possible. Um, but uh, but but you know this the. I, I think it does ask like too much of staff and parents to be comfortable with what's going on and with a plan. I think ultimately when you look at this, it really does come down to trust us and um, I, you know, to some extent or another. And um, I do trust, I do trust our administration. So that's what I have to say. Thank you, Phil. Um, Keith McFarland has a question. Uh, kind of question, comment, and that, it, it's already been uh, brought up and Darius started to address it. And I would like to, it has to do with what happens, you know, what are the benchmarks if there are positive tests in the school? Well, one of my employees tested positive and it, it's the amount of contact tracing, the amount of work calls to the Department of Public Health is very hard and I'd hate to see what would happen in the school. So I, I do hope that you can look for that guidance on what are the parameters that we would need to close. But there you also said you need the, the guidance on if we go remote, what what is it to reopen? And I don't think the school committee should be making that. I think I would hope that the state would provide that guidance as well. So I hope that we could press them for, you know, the benchmarks we need to close, but we also should press them for the benchmarks of what we would need to reopen as well. Thank you, okay. Keith. Um, Laura Valdivizio Viezo and Pixie Holbrook. Uh, I'm going to, I know you both have questions that you want to ask, but I'm going to ask you to hang on to them for a minute. I just want to give our school committee members the chance to uh, comment and question before we, before we allow the public back in. So if I, uh, hopefully I'll be getting back to you, but we'll see. Just a moment. Uh, David Sharp. Yeah. Hi. Um, just um, a couple comments, I guess. When we talk about the metrics, um, they kind of should be thinking about them in, in all directions, I guess. Um, if we do a hybrid plan, um, I think everybody realizes that that's sort of a, a difficult thing for the community. A little bit confusing for a while, most likely, because we're kind of trying to prepare ourselves to uh, teach a new regime of in-person uh, in a more sort of distanced, masked, perhaps outdoor way when the weather is uh, allowing. And then we're also using that time to perfect and improve upon our uh, remote learning. I said, nobody wants this hybrid model uh, to go on and on and on. And so the other metric question is, if in fact we continue, um, and I think it is perhaps a, point, a little bit more on the percentage of, you know, people who are not possible um, around the country or maybe going to, or even in our community are going to, are going to set us back a bit. But the flip side is continuing to be a mini um, sort of isolated safe place. And we see that many, many places have gone back to school probably with our numbers like certain countries. 
you know, what's that metric to say, okay, we've been doing this hybrid thing. Things are looking good. I suspect many people in our community would like to know when do we go back to uh, the in-person part of it, sort of, you know, flowing in so that we are now teaching in that way and then, you know, backing out of it, of course, um, when the uh, metrics uh, go the other way. So I just sort of throwing that out that the hybrid is um, it's like a holding pattern uh, where it could go either direction. Um, this is sort of a, a silly comment, but Darius, I know that, you know, the big issues, you know, the science and everything now, masks, distance, and uh, get outside if you can. Uh, and I just, whether we have, um, you know, uh, making a run on party tents and uh, uh, those kind of things for outdoor learning, or we just going to hope that um, people are going to bring their sun hats and we're going to shady spots uh, when we can. Uh, and again, thank you, administration, for all your very difficult and hard work on all this. So just a quick answer to that last con that last question David asked there. Um, you know, we're lining it up. Question is a lot of money to spend. And so that's kind of, this is the difficult spot. As we, you know, I've kind of said in all meetings, like this is a difficult spot to be in. You know, you know the information's coming, it came slow through the summer to help us. And at the same time, you know, we have a obviously you know, very different views on whether or not we should open or not. And so to go spend, you know, tens of thousand dollars on tents across the district, um, you know, is uh, we're waiting. So we really have people lined up um, their lists of things to do. You know, we've made connections and stuff, but the orders haven't been made um, for the tents. We've ordered other things that we know we can use later, such as PPEs and stuff, but even some of the other um, <clears throat> smaller barriers between children for classroom use and stuff, we have those orders ready and lined up, ready to go, but we're, we're holding off on spending too much money um, to, for, for one model or another. I think we have to be, we have to be cautious there. Um, we've already invested quite a bit, but I think no matter what our return looks like, I think we'll be using most of those materials. Because if we, you know, we turn in six months, unless we go the magic pill cure, you know, where everybody just takes the pill and everybody's all better. Um, if we have that, then we're going to be, you know, uh, we won't need a make <laughs> We'll sell <laughs> these. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Michael Merritt asks if a vote for hybrid takes place for the roughly one fifth to one sixth of the families that indicated their preference for remote learning, specifically at the elementary school, will they have a different teacher during in-person cohort days? Will remote learning be taught by the same classroom teachers or will remote learning be handled by different teachers? I think is essentially what Michael's asking. Am I right or wrong, Michael? <laughs> that, that's essentially what I'm asking is if a family is choosing remote and but the school is doing hybrid, do they have the same teacher or different? When I looked at the middle school plan, it, it, it appeared to me that they would actually have a different teacher dedicated to remote learning. So I would assume that, to me, yes. it wasn't clear to me at the elementary level. I'm happy to pop on, Darius, if you want me to. Um, you know, we look at it, the children that start off with remote at the beginning of the school year, if we do indeed pass the hybrid plan, would have a different teacher. We might do creative groupings where, you know, say there's three kids from Conway and four from Deerfield and two from Sunderland that in second grade that may make a class for a teacher in second grade. The children that are in families that are choosing the hybrid model would their classroom teacher would teach the remote on one day and the in-person on the other. So that's the difference pieces. So it gets a little confusing when you think of remote because the hybrid has the remote embedded. That will be a consistent teacher. If students and families choose the remote from the get-go, it will be a different teacher, but, but a consistent one throughout that process. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, uh, do we have anything else out there? Uh, Darius, are we going to executive session tonight? So um, we are, we can, because if it's up to the committee right now, there's, there's no agenda for an executive session, but anytime we, we talk about negotiation of contracts, if we have, if you have questions regarding the teacher's contract in this, you could go to negotiate, you could go to an executive session and have a discussion. So that's why I put it on there. I don't have anything particular. Okay. There's no, there's no ongoings right now with the association. 
Um, I, you know. I just I, I ask that because we're coming up on an, on an hour and a half in the meeting. And I know um, I had two people from the public that had a question. I think one of them just signed off, but um, I could recognize them if we're not going to executive session. If we were going to executive session, I would not recognize them. So. Um, so it sounds like we're not. So I'll look at uh, Pixie Holbrook. Did you have a question? Oh, Pixie Holbrook asked, question, is the state requiring fire drills and lockdown drills? It seems to be hard to do if so, you know, if socially distanced. So um, I'm sorry, I, thought, uh, I, I did not read it in, in its entirety. I, I would assume we'd still be required to do lockdown drills and fire drills, and we'd have to figure out the protocols as we head into the school year, most definitely. So yeah. yep. um, my apologies. And I do believe Laura... I thought I saw it flash that Laura Val Divisio um, or what uh, has left the meeting. I, if you're there, Laura, you can certainly speak up. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? Um, uh, we, we have a meeting next week in which we will undertake a final decision or a decision. Um, and uh, I certainly appreciate 100% participation by the committees tonight. Um, this is important. This is, a, it goes without saying, um, it's a, an incredible process we're going through here this summer. It's something I've never experienced, certainly, and none of us ever have. Um, so, um, we can uh, oh. <clears throat> we can move, I guess, to, to consider adjournment. Uh, Sarah Colsey, I had one more question just pop up. Between the hybrid model and remote models, which one keeps the most staff employed? I don't know if, <clears throat> if that. Okay, by, by the remote model does not need as much staff as the hybrid model. <clears throat> okay. It, it just it just doesn't in the sense that there's there are positions in the school that don't aren't needed in a remote setting. Okay. So. Um, we have a question concerning how many students would be in a classroom each day, um, and I don't I don't I think we necessarily have that answer. Each classroom would be different, would it not? Uh, depending on the physical space and everything else. Right. The average space of the elementary classroom can hold about sixteen students. Depending on some of the information that we don't have, is we don't know how many are doing. If again, if we went forward with the if with a hybrid model, um, you know how many we're signing electing up for the remote model could change that overall number of how many are in there. Um, but we're not going to have more than sixteen in a classroom due to spacing, keeping the six feet perimeter um, distancing within that. Okay. You know, you know what there was also just Kimmy, if I could just jump on as well. Sure. There's one thing that was passed in the beginning about the masks. And it came up in one of the uh, in one of the meetings uh, later on that the mask got confusing. Masks coming off in the classroom have to be done in a way which is like a mask break, where um, the students are control is a controlled model. Meaning, what I was trying to do, and I, and I guess I confused parents in some of the town halls. So I'm, you know, um, I hope I can bring it out here. Is that I was trying to show that like students will not be trapped behind a mask, stuck in a desk, six feet apart all day long, and that there'll be opportunities for the masks to come off even when they're doing work. But I want to show like a scenario. If I had a fifth grade class in front of me, and let's say there's about seven students because I divide my class over two classrooms, and the IA took half the class, and I'm sitting with my seven students, and we're working on an assignment. I could say. We are now going to do a mask break while you work on an assignment. You are now well over six feet apart. You can take your mask off, but nobody can get up from their desk until the mask break is over. Because the, when the students have the mask off, the teacher can't walk around the room either. So everybody's kind of in their place. And then students are working away. And it's like, okay, you know, if you have a little ding or whatever, um, you know, mask break is now over. Please put them on. We're going to begin our discussion on what we just we're working on it, something of that sort. So you can see it's a, a structured time, but it can occur while working. I think some parents were thinking that they're over six feet apart and a kid just take their mask off. And also within that, we're going to have mask break ability, meaning that the students can say, you know what, instead of I got to go to the bathroom, can I go to the mask break area? And so that was also, you know, they're talking about that. Teachers were talking about it. Administrators are talking about being able to, you know, sometimes, you know, you just got to take the thing off for a minute. It's getting itchy or something. So there's a new way of, of doing that as well within it. So I just wanted to clarify that because 
I was so I was so giving emphasis about like we're not going to trap your child behind a mask all day long that I didn't think about the people who were concerned about like you're having the kids take masks off in the classroom that goes against the purpose of the whole thing. So if you can see, I was trying to get that. There. Thanks, Ken, for letting me do that. Okay, um, I I have here uh, Keith McFarland has a quick question and Katie has a budget question. So we'll start with Keith. Uh, I thought David had a question before me. Um, did I miss something? <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Go ahead, David. <laughs> um, yeah, and I don't, I'm, I don't want to throw a wrench here at all. And oh, I'm it, sorry. I covered this a little bit. Um, obviously, Darius administration wants, um, you know, the school committees all to come up with the same plan. Uh, <laughs> Well, we've got four school committees in four towns. And did, has anybody answered the question of sort of um, the potential legal issue there of, um, you know, those wild cards up in Conway? You never know what they're going to do. And so they may get together and say, hey, we want, you know, in person fully. Um, and everyone else says we want hybrid or one says remote, two say hybrid and one says in person. I just don't want to ruin your evening. But have, has that been, are, you, are we able to present that we have to have Union 38 policy, or is that really a problem? I agree, we need consensus because it would drive the administration bonkers. You would, it's so basically, so you're asking because you're the attorney in the room, you're asking the, <laughs> the right, you're asking the right legal question. Legally, schools could technically choose different plans. You would be dropping a, an atomic bomb on the current makeup of Union 38, uh, of, you know, Union 38 here. Um, because you would be exposing the fact that our union is a union of brought together to work as one under one teachers association, but technically the teachers association could be broken into four pieces. And, you know, you really, that was not a question I wanted to answer um, because I, it, 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 it causes different types of politics and then politics that divide us when I've been working really hard to bring everybody together. Um, but technically you, that is correct. You could technically just as though, you know, you could break negotiations and have it done by town. I mean, it, you then, you know, I don't, you know, I'd rather, no, I'd like to move us more toward becoming one rather than splitting apart because it's already a headache as it is. But technically, yes. Thank you, David. I will hunt you down. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it just raises the important um, sort of parliamentary issue for next week as to whether we're doing four separate votes, um, hoping they get consensus or whether we're doing one big vote. I'm not advocating that way. I'm just saying that, you know, there's certain people who may get, want to, you know, we just got to make another sure that we... Excellent, another excellent point. I think we'll be probably posting it as four individual meetings coming together so that, that we have the legal the legal right on each one of those to just to make sure. Um, and it also makes sure that all members have a voting, have a vote rather than the you know, right. uh, three from each committee because they would give you the each person, one person, one vote law as well. So um, I think it's a good, it's a good thing. We were going to have to do that anyways, because um, when we did vote the association, um, uh, the agreement for the association last last time, um, it does have to be done individually by each school committee. Each school so, committee. Yeah, so we got to, we do have to do that vote again. Um, like I said, we, it was a non, it was a unanimous vote last time. So mm -hmm. it's just a procedural thing. So we'll end up doing that as well. Okay. All right. Thanks. Keith, you were kind enough to uh, notice David, so it's your turn. Uh, yeah, just a, a follow up for Darius. Um, you know, my main one of my main concerns is what happens when someone gets sick. And what are the metrics that we move from hybrid to remote? Or on the flip side, what would be if everyone's healthy, we move from remote to hybrid? And you said the state was going to give some guidance to the superintendents next week. My quick question is, is that something that you think will be released publicly or is that going to be going specifically and only to the superintendents? And then a follow up, do you think the state may even just sidestep that and just dump it in our laps and, and you have this amalgamation of ideas? Yep. <laughs> You're muted, Darius. Darius, you're muted. Darius, you're muted. Yeah. Some people were very happy about me being muted. The, uh, that's the right there is the draft of, that we have for protocol for potential closure. Um, it was it was loaded up into the draft that the other the draft we gave everybody um, is a live document. So we've been adding to it and, and changing things. I did split out the supplement for the hybrid for tonight's meeting because it was that's where all the 
a lot of the changes was, but that was in there as well. And I apologize that um, as well. So you can kind of go through that we have been taking the state's recommendation and developing it. And I think the big, the big question is within it is, um, you know, right in the beginning, as I, we, I put it in bold, the state indicator needed here for a regional data point. We don't really have um, the data point for if the, if the community as a whole has, um, you know, an outbreak, but it's not in the school yet. You know what I mean? You know, or even a neighboring community. If, you know, for instance, you know, in Northampton or Amherst or Greenfield was to have a major outbreak, we're, we're connected to those communities. And so what would be those numbers that would affect our school so that we keep people safe? And so that's where I need, a, need help because some of the other, you know, so as you can kind of go through, some of the other stuff is kind of cut and dry, um, depending on, you can see that a lot of things lead to closures, Keith, as you look at that, um, which is kind of, you know, um, the difficult part of the hybrid models that we're going to try to keep people safe. So if you have more than one outbreak in a school where you can trace that there's more than one outbreak in the school through the tracing that we have some kind of spread, then we're going to have to shut things down. We may have to shut things down just for a couple of days in order to assess, you know, the tracing to figure out that we don't have an outbreak within the community, but just maybe a singleton issue. Um, or we may have to go right to remote learning for 14 days and and, and, and go, and then, you know, as you talked last time, Keith, your word of you being fluid from one model back and forth um, is something that we're going to have to do as well. So um, the hybrid model is a more difficult model that is without a doubt, and it's far more taxing on the um, administrators as well. So trying to figure in nursing as well. Um, yes. And teachers, I guess, maybe even you could say teachers, especially even in the beginning, but. Mm -hmm. um, so. Katie. Budget question. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm off mute, right? Yes. Um, yes. So I, I know that um, there's a lot of moving parts still, and I know that we're not going to make this decision based on budget, but I, budget is one of our responsibilities as school committee members. And so I know, you, I'm sure, Darius, you have thought about this already. Can you help us understand how we are going to get familiar with what the impacts of the budget is? Or we, we are going to decide on the model, and then the budget impact will become be shared with us i don't know i guess i'm just curious how you're thinking about the budget side of all of this so again i guess you know the honesty is either a good trade of mine or a bad trade i didn't really want to bring money into it in the fact that you know a remote model you can reduce positions and save money because it then because mm -hmm. then you then you i mean i know us we have to be fiscally sound but we have a budget set for next year and we can we can where our goal was to be able to do the hybrid model within the budget and the extra money that's coming in from grants from the state you know, okay. um, the, the hybrid model is a cheaper model. I mean, the remote model is a cheaper model if we were in an, in an economic crunch there. And that's what we was a, a cursor for our decision. I was afraid that if I started putting that out there, then I'm kind of playing unfair games with what models which because of that kind of thing. So, um, so anyway, so, you know, um, I am looking, um, Shelly is on the call as well. She can kind of, um, I think she's on the call, but she can give a, I'm here. I get it quick. But I want to do, I do want to do a meetings of the individual committees in August to talk mm -hmm. about where we stand with our budget, how we closed off our books. I kind of said mm -hmm. that in the email that I sent out to everybody, but, um, you know, it's kind of one, kind of one thing at a time, but Shelly, you want to just give an overview of how we are financially as a, as a, as a whole? Sure. Not a problem. Um, so I'm wrapping up end of year from FY20 at each of the elementary schools. And when we do individual meetings, I will have an update on where we landed with our savings from FY20 that we were going to move funds into school choice. Mm -hmm. um, so that analysis is in process. And uh, I'm also looking very closely at the budgets that were previously passed for general fund. Um, we have sort of a quote unquote hiring freeze right now where we have vacant positions at every school and you may see those positions posted um, and principals may be seeing what is out there for applications, um, but we're not actually hiring anyone at the moment until we know exactly what the plan is and what we need for staff. So if some of those positions uh, are unfunded, um, or not unfunded, if they can remain vacant, we should be able to capture those funds for other expenses. Um, and then right now we have three grant sources that we're receiving at all five of the schools. And um, in regards to the elementary schools, uh, 
everyone is receiving what to me feels like a decent amount of money. And when I say that, I'm saying at least $50,000 or more so far funded between the three um, grant sources that we've captured. And we're looking every day and paying attention to see what else is out there, you know, and, and trying to see um, where we can get savings and capture more grant money. So I feel like there's a lot of unknowns still, but I also know that we have resources that we didn't have two and three months ago when we started talking about this. And even in June, when we were looking at approving budgets with the unknown, and I feel like we're in a far better position than we were at that point. Um, and I think we're gonna end up being okay in the end. Great, thank you. And, and yeah, I'm certainly not, I don't think we need to make this decision based on money, but it sounds like you have been thinking that through and yeah. that you're working within the budgets that we have approved and with these other funding sources that it should be, we should be able to cover it all. So thank yeah, you. We're being really um, moderate or, or, uh, and conservative with ordering too, like Darius said before, you know, trying, having the lists of, we know what we think we're gonna need based on if we are to open or not open. Um, and then just only ordering right now what we need to. So we have some tight reins on the finances at this point. Great, thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, I got to go back to the chat side here. Sorry. <clears throat> Michael Merritt's last comment, the thoroughness and thoughtfulness put into these plans is amazing and very much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, the administration and staff are amazing and greatly appreciated. Um, some of these others are coming from the general public, it seemed, or, or from teachers, I don't know which. Um, Darius, Sarah, Jessica. Um, Jessica Corwin notes that the school closure protocol document has email addresses for two statewide officials and it's recommended email them to request public health benchmarks and metrics from the state, so. Anyways, okay, I think Trevor, Katie, okay, I think that brings us to the end here. Uh, I'm assuming no more questions, comments, etc., are out there. So um, I'll entertain a motion if someone would like to make it. Motion to adjourn. Trevor. Now, moves to adjourn. Anyone care to second? Or do I have to? I'll okay. second. <laughs> Phil seconded. Thank you, Phil. Um, <laughs> we'll do a quick roll call on the voting members just to make it a little quicker. Elaine, are you out there? I'm here. Uh, are you in favor? Yes. Michael Merritt? Yes. Phil? Cantor. Yes. Gregory Goshow. You out there, Greg? Yes, yes. Okay, Peter Gagarin. Yes. Jessica Corwin. Yes. Ken Cutterback, yes. David Sharp. Yes, thanks. Carrie, Carrie Etchells. Yes. Katie Edwards. Yes. Bob Halla. Yes, sir. And Maureen. Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. We are all adjourned and uh, thank you all for attending this evening. It's uh, really, it's really great to see 100% participation. And uh, thank you, Darius and your team, Kim, thank you all, very Sarah, much. the whole gang for all of this incredible work. Um, it's amazing. So have a great night, everyone. Talk in a week.